Okay, so we're talking about uh, the kings of North Israel and South Judah. The kingdom has divided. I told you before, North Israel is kind of a mess. They, they never did have a faithful king. And uh, last couple of weeks, we've talked about Ahab and Ahab and Elijah. Okay, well, that's up in North Israel, and Ahab was unbelievably wicked and was uh, somehow famous for how wicked he was. And so now we're going to go back down to South Judah to his contemporary in South Judah, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is Asa's son. And three weeks ago, we talked about Asa, and Asa was that man that, that was fully dedicated to the Lord all of his life. He reigned for 41 years uh, in South Judah, uh, a great man of God. Well, Jehoshaphat is his son, and Jehoshaphat was just like his dad. He loved the Lord with all of his heart. He, he relied on the Lord. He, he sought the Lord. And so you're, we're going to see that in, in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 today as, as we look at this chapter. So a couple things about Jehoshaphat. One is between he and Asa together, uh, father and son, they ruled over South Judah for 66 years. That's quite a significant amount of time in, in South Judah's history from the time the kingdom split until they went into captivity uh, was with these two men. And they were fine, fine men of God, and uh, they are worthy of being emulated by us. 66 years, that would be what, 1953? Is that right? It would be how many, how many years in American history? Can you imagine just having two leaders since 1953? That shows you how much time in history they took up in, in the nation of Israel. Uh, the, the Jehoshaphat made one decision uh, that cost him a lot. And, and I would encourage you, we're, you know, when we're looking at these kings, some of these kings have four or five chapters written about them. I'm just picking out one story in one chapter. So I really encourage you to go back, read the whole story of Asa, read the whole story of Jehoshaphat, read the whole story of Ahab and Elijah. There's some fascinating stories. We're picking out one each week. But, but Jehoshaphat's... Um, his downfall was his association with Ahab. Uh, he and Ahab were friends, and in fact, in your notes, it will tell you here uh, that Jehoshaphat arranged a marriage for his oldest son, Jehoram, to one of Ahab's daughters. And that ended up literally destroying the nation of South Judah, ultimately. And so, you look at this guy, he lives a great life, but he makes one bad decision, but that bad decision literally led to the downfall of the entire nation. And so Jehoshaphat uh, and Ahab were friends and uh, even family uh, after that wedding. Okay, so we're going to look today at an interesting uh, story, and I'm just going to read through it. And some of these stories in the Old Testament, they get redundant. Can we just be honest and say that? Not that you can't get jewels out of every story. But, but some of the stories start sounding alike. And so what I'm trying to do as we go through here is, is look at it from different angles so that we get different things out of the text. So in this story, I just went through and said, okay, how do we view this story from spiritual warfare perspective? What, what, are, the, what are the spiritual warfare tools that we can find in this story that we can put in our own life, tools that we can put in our own life for spiritual warfare? Okay, so there's eight of them. And uh, we'll talk about uh, each one of these as we go along. So uh, let's begin. Second Chronicles chapter 20. I'm going to end up reading this entire chapter. Now, context, several armies have united to attack Judah. And so Jehoshaphat, because he's like his father Asa, he did not go out and uh, bring in uh, other armies. He did not make alliances with other countries. He depended on the Lord his God. So guess how this story is going to end? Jehoshaphat's going to win, right? So the whole story is about Jehoshaphat not only seeking the Lord, but leading the entire country of Judah to seek the Lord. And so that's what we'll see in this story. So beginning in verse, chapter 20, verse 1, After this, the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Meonites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army of Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They are already at Hazazon Tamar. That was another name for En Gedi. In other words, they're close. <laughs> they're coming. So Jehoshaphat was alarmed by this news and sought the Lord for guidance. 
And I underlined that word guidance in my Bible. But do you remember the, the word that we kept seeing with Asa over and over again? He sought the Lord. He sought the Lord. He sought the Lord. Well, what do we hear about Jehoshaphat? He's just like his daddy. He is seeking the Lord for guidance. He also gave orders that everyone throughout Judah should observe a fast. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord. Okay, there's the word again, seek the Lord. Jehoshaphat stood before the people of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard of the temple of the Lord. He prayed, O Lord God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are rulers of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand against you. So, are you ready? This is shocking. <laughs> Spiritual warfare tool number one, prayer. Prayer. He brought all of Judah together, and they all sought the Lord together. And what did he do? He led the entire country in prayer. And they sought the Lord for guidance as to what to do about these three armies that have gathered to attack them that are going to be much bigger than, than who they are as an army. And so uh, prayer is that first frontline spiritual warfare tool that we need to use. Um, and, and man, I've done 10 week series on prayer. So how do you sum it up in three minutes? <laughs> prayer is a conversation with the creator of the universe. God has all power. He has all authority. He creates all things. His will is in everything. And, and the, the creative being that created you and has all authority over everything is saying to you, I'm going to give you a tool where you can communicate with me one-on-one. -on -one. You don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to go through another person. You don't have to go through anybody else. You can come directly to me and share your heart with me. And are you ready for this? Not only that, I will listen to you and when it's your best interest, I will answer your prayers exactly like you want them answered. Now, the caveat is we don't always pray in our best interest, right? <laughs> we pray in our selfish interest, but we don't necessarily pray in our best interest. And that is the reason most of the time God doesn't answer our prayers the way we ask Him. Okay? But He says, I want you to come, I want you to ask, and when it's your best interest, you have my ear, you have my concern, and I'm going to protect you and do what's best for you so you seek me out. That is a great spiritual warfare tool. So when the enemy comes, what do we need to do? We need to start praying, right? Because we have the attention of the Almighty God. So uh, let's go around the tables. Let's talk about that uh, just for a few minutes, and then we'll come back um, and, and we'll go to the second one. Now, what I want you to notice on your notes is, is the way I've arranged this that we're going to video is, is he'll cut it right back there before I said we're going to talk about it. And I'm just going to have one set of questions on the video at the end. So I don't have a question for each one, but I think you know a little bit about prayer. So what I just want you to do around the table, around each one of these, is just ask the question, uh, so, so how do you use prayer in spiritual warfare? What, what have you learned about prayer? Okay, so just chat for a couple of minutes and we'll come back and we'll go to the second one. The second one is faith in God. Faith in God. Do you, do you remember in Ephesians chapter 6, um, Paul wrote about the armor of God, and he compared faith to a shield, right? And that shield uh, protects us from the darts of the arrow, one, uh, uh, from the evil one, the arrows of the evil one. And so that's what we see here in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 6 through 9. Uh, he prayed, oh, oh, I'm sorry, verse 7 through 9. Oh God, uh, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people arrived? And did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here and built this temple for you. They said, whenever we are faced with any calamity, such as war, disease, or famine, we can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. Now listen to this phrase. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us, and you will rescue us. You hear the faith there?
Notice what he says. He says, listen, you made promises to us in the past. And he recites history. When we came here, you gave us this land. You promised us this was our, this land, was our land. And you promised us you would take good care of us, that you would protect us when enemies came against us. And so we know that we can come and pray to you and cry out to you and meet right here on the steps of this temple and you will hear us and you will deliver us. That is faith. And faith is a huge spiritual warfare weapon. It is the shield. It is the defense against the lies of the enemy. Now I want you to think about this. Spiritual warfare is ultimately a warfare over what? Information. Lies and truth. Clarity versus confusion. God always brings truth. God always brings clarity. Satan always brings lies. He always brings confusion. Correct? And so his darts, his, his arrows that he's shooting at us, are arrows that are lies, trying to confuse us, trying us to walk away from God, to step away from our faith. And what happens is, is if it, our faith is a shield that when He shoots those arrows, it knocks those arrows down so they don't penetrate our hearts. Because if they penetrate our hearts, the lies can become beliefs we have about ourselves, which can go down to our core identity. And if Satan can ever get to our core identity, he has us, right? So God says, look, you're mine. But Satan's not going to give up on you. He's, he's not going to give up lying to you. But you know what you have? You have your faith. So every time the enemy comes to you and he's lying to you, you know what you have access to? Your faith to say, you know what? That's not true, enemy. You know what? You can say that about me, but that's not what God says about me. You know what? You can try to cause confusion, but reality is this is the truth. And so that's what our faith is. Our faith goes back and says, you know what? God... And what he says is true and not what you say, Satan. And it protects us from us beginning to believe the lies that the enemy has to say. Because before we, we act in such a way that then dishonors God, there's always something going on in the brain where we're believing a lie that's leading us down that path. So if you want to win spiritual warfare in your life, where do you win it? Right up here in the mind. And what's one of your primary tools? Faith. Faith. Okay? So go around the table, talk about faith for a minute, and then we'll come back and talk about the third one. Okay. Our third spiritual warfare tool. There's eight of them this morning, so we're going we're gonna to pick up the pace a little bit. The third one is submission to God. I don't think we think about submission to God being a spiritual warfare tool. But listen to this, uh, beginning in verse uh, 10. And now uh, see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let our ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Egypt, so they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us, for they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh, oh our God, won't you stop them? Listen to this. We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. What is that? That is submission. That's saying, God, I can't do this. But I'll tell you one thing I can do. I can rest in you, and you can do this for me. And I want to tell you something. God loves that posture. He, loves, he doesn't like the posture of the man beating his chest saying, I can do this by myself. That's pride, right? That puts you against God. But when you submit yourself to God and say, God, I'm powerless, but you have all the power. And what does Paul say? And through you, I can do all things. Why? Because you give me the strength. It's your power. Do you remember when the, the children of Israel were uh, trapped up against the Red Sea and the Egyptians were coming and they were panicking? Go back and read that story. I think it's Exodus 14, I think is the chapter. But, but if you'll look at that, Moses says, you're going to see the power of the Lord today. He's going to deliver you from these Egyptians. You need only to rest. In the middle of a battle, how do you rest? You submit to the Lord. You submit to Him. And so one of the tools we have to access the power of God in our lives is not only prayer, 
but the whole attitude of submission. And the more submissive I am, and the more I trust in His power to deal with the issues for me, doesn't mean I don't do anything, right? Sometimes resting in God is, is very active. Then He comes on my behalf, and He wins the battles for me. So think about that in terms of spiritual warfare and the enemy, Satan. What is God wanting you to do? Don't go fight Satan. He, he, he's going to win every time, right? Go submit to God, stay under the presence of God, and He will fight and win that battle for you. Okay? Let's talk about that, and then we'll come back to number four. Number four is the promises of God. The promises of God. This is found as 13 through 16. As all the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. His name was Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite who was a descendant of Asaph. Now, now that is unfair that the Lord does that, doesn't it? I, I mean, how do you read through that? He said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jezreel. So I will pick up the rest of that in just a second. But, but what does this one represent? This one represents the Word of God, right? Now, in this case, uh, it, is, it is the Word of God presented through this man who's giving a prophecy. But the promises of God or the Word of God that we know from Ephesians 6 is the primary offensive weapon. It's the sword of the Spirit. Boy, that's a huge spiritual warfare tool, correct? And, and it is one that we have at our disposal at all times, the Word when Satan comes and attacks, what's the best way to get Satan to retreat? Pull out the Word and start reading Scripture, right? It's interesting to me that Jesus prayed, lead me not into temptation. But when temptation comes, you know what Jesus does? He doesn't pray. What does He do? Quote Scripture. Quote Scripture. Go to Luke 4 and Matthew 4 and read the temptation stories. When Satan comes and tempts Jesus, He doesn't say, Lord, help me. He said, it is written. And as soon as he starts quoting Scripture, what happens to Satan? He's defeated and goes back. Don't underestimate the power of the Word of God because that is the sword. That is the sword that pierces the lies of the enemy. Because if spiritual warfare is about lies and truth, what is the Bible? Truth. Anything that disagrees that the Bible is a lie. It doesn't matter how sugar-coated it is. It doesn't matter... How much culture says that that's the way it's supposed to be now that we're enlightened? It doesn't matter. If it is contrary to the Word of God, it is a lie from the enemy. And he's very good at putting uh, lipstick on that pig, isn't he? He's really good at that. But at the end of the day, it is still a pig. Correct? So really, really important one. Very important. Let's move on because there's, there's a couple I really want to talk about and spend some time on because they're not things we talk about that much. This next one is the presence of God. I love verse 17, but you will not even need to fight. Anybody know how this story ends, by the way? This is a great story. Listen to this. You will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you. Underline that phrase in your Bible. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out there tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Why can they take solace in this? Why can they sleep that night? Why do they not have to worry about this? Why does he say, don't be afraid or discouraged? What's that repeating phrase? Because the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. It's the presence of God, and that's in the top of the second page of your notes. The presence of God. Now, if you'll notice what, what I said here, I, I want to read a, a little bit of this. The presence of God is enough. We don't need anything else, and He doesn't need our help to win the battle. Do you understand that? 
He doesn't need our help to win the battle. God can win it without us. Now, He will often ask us to do something in the battle. He, he doesn't let us sit on the sideline. We go to the battle with Him, and He'll ask us to do something. It usually has something to do with faith in Him and surrender to Him in the battle. And then He fights and wins the battle on our behalf. One of the signs of spiritual maturity is when we get to a place in our faith that we don't think we need to help God out. That's a sign of spiritual maturity. We learn, you know what? God doesn't need my help. God needs my submission, right? God wants my faith, but He, he doesn't need me to help Him out. He's got this. Remember last week when Elijah was so depressed and God showed Himself to Elijah? And what did we talk about? Is the presence of God enough? Is God enough just His presence? What if He doesn't show up with His power? What if He doesn't rescue you from a circumstance? Is His presence enough? And over and over and over again in Scripture, Scripture says, yes, a resounding yes. The presence of God is enough. If He is with you, you don't have to fear, you don't have to worry, because He's going to fight the battle for you. So, the next time you're worried about the future, next time you're fearful about something coming, what do you need to remember? He's with me. I don't have to fear this. I don't have to fear how to pay the bills. I don't have to fear what's happening in this relationship. I don't have to fear what's going on in this job. Why? Because God is with me. All I need to do is surrender to Him and let Him fight this battle for me. Because when that happens... When I get to the place he doesn't need my help, then boy, he really fights on my behalf and wins that battle. Here's what happens. When, when I think God needs my help, I go in and I begin to manipulate situations and just make things worse. Have you ever been in a situation where you go, you know, I really shouldn't get involved in this, and then you get involved and it, you just blow it up? Have you done? Am I the only one that does that? And, and, and finally, I'm, I'm almost 57, I'm going to be 57 in, in June, and I'm finally learning the lesson that my involvement and help with God usually makes it worse. It doesn't make it better. The best thing I can do is submit and pray, right? And God will take care of it. So um, let's talk about that, and then we'll jump in and, and deal with a couple more. Okay, these next two are, are really exciting, and the next two are the point of the story, and they're also two things that we don't necessarily think about as spiritual warfare weapons, and, and uh, this gets really exciting to me. So uh, I'm going to pick it up now in verse 18, uh, because we're getting to the climax of the story here. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. So what was their response? They're worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites from the clans of Kohath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. So there's praise and there's worship. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in His prophets, and you will succeed. After consulting the leaders of the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the armory, singing to the Lord and praising Him for His holy splendor. This is what they sang, Give thanks to the Lord, His faithful love endures forever. So can you imagine that the frontline people on your army are the singers? You know, if you're in that camp that day, you're probably going, I don't have a good voice. I'm... <laughs> Yeah, that's, just, that's not my gift. That's not my, you know, in church today, people love to be on that stage singing. Back then, they didn't want to be on the front lines, right? But they're the front line people. All the people with the weapons are in the back. But the primary weapon's in the front. It's those worshipers of the Lord, okay? Now, worship is a huge spiritual warfare weapon. 
a huge spiritual warfare weapon. And I'm going to talk about this one and the next one together, uh, but I want to say this about uh, worship of God and, and just, just the mind. Think about it. If, if spiritual warfare is what's going on between truth and lies in the brain, uh, music is setting the tone for what you think about all the time. Music sets the tone for how your brain is responding to truth and lies, okay? Um, I, I listen to worship music, okay? I do, I love it. But I'm just going to tell you, I was raised in the 70s, and what I really love is 70s classic rock and roll. That's just what I love. Um, it, everything from the Eagles uh, to Van Halen to Aerosmith, to Foreigner, to all of that stuff from the 70s, I just love it. And, and if you sat in my car, yes, I'm confessing this to you, there are a couple of Christian radio stations, but there are a couple of classic rock stations. And I listen to them, and I kind of go back and forth. But here's what I found. If I go, let's say 14 days, if I go 14 days and I'm listening to those rock stations exclusively, and then I go 14 days and I listen to the worship music exclusively. The condition of my brain is completely different. When I listen to that rock music for an extended period of time, I get fleshy. I get angrier quicker. I think more selfishly. Um, I, I, I think fleshier. I, 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 just, I just think more about things of this world and money, and sex, and power, and what pleases me. I just become a more selfish person. And you go, well, that's ridiculous. It's really not. It's really not. The power of music is one of the single most powerful tools that God and Satan have in cultures across the board for all time. It just is true. When you, when you learn something by music, you remember the words and you never forget them, right? I, 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 was, uh, I took Hebrew, a year's worth of Hebrew, in a month in a, in a Presbyterian seminary in Austin one time. Most miserable month of my life. Do you know how they taught us Hebrew? We sang it. Because they knew if we could tie the words to music, we would remember the words. Isn't that interesting? Think about it. I can sing you a song, and, and even, even those of you who are young... If I sang you a song you've heard on the radio and I started a line, you could probably finish the line, right? Because it just sticks in you. Well, if that's true with secular music, it's also true with worship music. And if you, th that music is what sets the tone of your brain for spiritual warfare. And it's going to be a whole lot harder to fight spiritual warfare if you're listening to secular music all the time, and that's the condition, that's the, that's the playground of your mind. When a lie comes, it's going to be a lot harder to combat that with truth. If you're listening to worship music all the time, it's a lot easier to combat that with truth. Does that make sense? Don't underestimate the power of music. I really want to encourage you to incorporate worship music in your life as a spiritual warfare tool. Okay, now let's go to the second, the second one here uh, that goes right along with it is confusion by God. Listen to this. At the moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they had finished off the army of Seir, they turned on each other. So that when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, there were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder. <laughs> Don't miss this. As they worshiped, what happened? God caused confusion in the enemy camp and they all turned on one another and killed each other so that when Judah came around the pass and looked down and they were ready to start fighting, everyone was already dead. Did God say He was going to fight their battle for them? And did He? Absolutely. Based on what? Worship, faith, presence of God, the promises of God, all of these things we've been talking about, God came in and fought that battle for them. They never had to draw a sword. Those singers ended up being pretty good weapons, didn't they? 
Now, when we think about confusion, we usually think about the enemy. We think, well, Satan confuses and God gives clarity. That's true for believers. But have you ever thought about the fact that part of the spiritual warfare tool is that God can turn around on my behalf and confuse the enemy? How many times do you read that kind of story in the Old Testament? Where God confuses the enemy on behalf of His people, and I don't know what the exact correlation is, but certainly here there is a correlation between the worship of God's people and the confusion of the enemy. I I don't know how deep to take that, and I don't know how how much to correlate that, but I'm telling you there's a correlation. You, You don't tell me worship music's important. Worship seems to be the context where God does the confusion of the enemy. And when the enemy is confused, guess what he does with us? Leaves us alone. Right? So God actually uses confusion on our behalf to confuse the enemy. And then finally, we're going to wrap the story up. They found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, and other valuables, more than they could carry. There was so much plunder that it took them three days just to collect it all. On the fourth day, they gathered in the Valley of Blessing, which got its name that day because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. It is called the Valley of Blessing today. And then it tells a story of them going back and having thanksgiving to God. And then verse 30, uh, 30, it says, So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. The same refrain that was in Asa's story, right? They were at peace and prosperity because God gave them rest due to the fact that they were faithful. So this, this last spiritual warfare tool is one we talk about all the time, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it's thanksgiving. When God, when God comes through, what do we do? We give thanks, right? And they spend a lot of time thanking God for the deliverance. Has God delivered you from anything? How about your sin? That's a pretty major deliverance, isn't it? So do you spend your days thanking God for what He's done for you? How can we walk as believers knowing that He has taken away our sin and our whole lives not be consumed with thanksgiving? How can you take that for granted? But boy, we can easily, can't we, if we get too caught up in the world. So God's given us this discipline of thanksgiving so that we will continue to give Him thanks, and that gives us that perspective that we need. Okay, so we're going to close out today. Uh, you've, got, you've got 10 minutes left. Uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll just leave it around your tables. You've got some questions there at the end. They're going to come up on the screen. Uh, talk about these last three in particular um, and how they can be used in spiritual warfare. And then God bless you guys. I, I hope the day goes well. Father, thank you for our time together this morning in the Word. Thank you for this unbelievable story out of Jehoshaphat's life. Thank you for Jehoshaphat and his faith and his dependence and his submission. And and Lord, that he is an example for us and how we're supposed to live our lives. And Father, how many battles have we faced with you? And and Lord, to look at this template, to look at these eight uh, tools that we have that we can put in our tool belt to fight the enemy. Lord, I, I just pray we will take full advantage of them and that we will use them uh, to win the battle and be the men of God you've called us to be. Thank you for this story. In Jesus' name, amen.